Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Amazed by the Quran, a series in which I try to share with you what I find amazing about the Quran. Today I want to start this conversation briefly with um, a description of the difference between nouns and verbs. That'll help you appreciate the ayat that I want to talk about, okay? So, by definition, nouns like apple, tree, happiness, etc. Nouns don't have a tense. They're not past or present or future. They're timeless in that sense. So rhetorically speaking, a noun is considered timeless. Verbs, on the other hand, have tense, past tense or present tense or future tense. Even the imperative is in the present tense in a sense. So tenses or verbs are temporary because they're not, they, they are caged in time. Okay? So nouns are timeless and verbs are caged in time. Now what happens in, in the Arabic language, interestingly, is sometimes when you're saying, talking about an act, you can actually use a noun or a verb. And when you translate that into the English language, when you translate it in the Quran, for example, at an average translation, we don't have that luxury in English, so we always translate it as a verb. Right? So you don't get to see that sometimes what we're thinking is a verb was actually used as a noun in the Quran. Because right? they're, they're just exactly the same way that would be translated. So for instance, in, in not in the Quran, but in regular Arabic, ajlisu, I'm sitting. Anajalis, I'm sitting. While ajlisu is a verb and jalis is a noun. So you wouldn't tell, you'd translate the same way, I'm sitting. Okay? Now let's appreciate the rhetorical difference as is used in the Quran. It's very subtle. So I'll give you three examples of that in you know, order of complexity. The first example is about hypocrites talking, uh, uh, talked about in Surah Al-Baqarah. And Allah says that when they come to believers, they say that they believe. When they, when they are in the company of believers, they would say that they have believed. When they're, in, when they're in the company of their devils, their shayateen, they say, we're with you, we were just, we're just joking. So now you've got, we believe and we're joking, which in the English language are both verbs. Interestingly enough, in the Arabic though, we believe is set as amanna, which is a verb. Now remember, verbs are temporary and joking is mustahzi'un, which is a noun. Like you wouldn't see that in translation. It'll just say joking and you'll think it's a verb, but it's a noun. Now what does that imply? The rhetorical implication thus is that these hypocrites, their, their long-term permanent allegiances lie with those who they speak in the, the long-term sense, meaning they're devils. Yes, they try to have loyalties on both sides, but they're long loyalties and their constancy is with the shayateen, with the devils, subhanAllah. And that's how Allah exposes where they lean more. Now the second case. This is about declaring Allah's perfection. Doing tasbih, as most Muslims know it is doing tasbih. We can't always do tasbih. Tasbih is not something that I can do constantly. After we do it after salah, we do it when we're remembering Allah, etc. Which is why it's understandable that in the Quran, when tasbih, declaring Allah's perfection, is talked about, it is talked about as a verb. Allah did not expect us to be musabbihin people who do the declaration of Allah's perfection constantly. It's impossible for us, right? Which is why even Allah says the entire heavens and the earth declare Allah's perfection and He uses a verb. Because we're included in it, shaitan, or the jinns are included in it, even if not shaitan, the jinn are included, and we don't do declaring of Allah's perfection constantly, okay? Now, there are two exceptions to that. The first exception is the Prophet Yunus. And the second exception is the angels talked about in the Qur'an, both in the 37th surah, Safat. Allah talks about when Yunus alayhi salam was in the belly of the whale, the biblical name Jonah, right? When he was in the belly of the whale. And Allah says, فَلَوْنَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ had, had it not been the case that he was from those who constantly declared perfection. You know, he would have remained in the belly of the whale. Now, how do I know he constantly declared perfection? Because unlike everywhere else in the Qur'an here, Allah decided to use a noun. The permanence is articulated. It's awesome. To suggest he has nothing else to think about when he's in the belly of the world. As long as he's there, he's just, how perfect you are, how perfect you are, how perfect you are, how perfect you are. Constantly, constantly, constantly declaring Allah's perfection. SubhanAllah. This also gives you an idea of how the standards for prophets are so much higher than for everybody else. Like when a Muslim gets in trouble, they ask Allah for a little bit of forgiveness, Allah pulls them out of trouble. But when prophets, who Allah expects so much more from, if they ever make a mistake, then the expectations from them are way, way, way higher. It makes us appreciate the status of those prophets. Of course, the other example also in Surah Al-Safat is the angels. Inna la nahnul musabbihun. We are the ones who declare perfection. That's how it's translated. Except the, 
who declare perfection is a noun, musabihun, in the Arabic, suggesting the angels are constantly, constantly engaged in the declaration of Allah's perfection. Now here's the last one, and this is the one that I think is the one that baffles me, and I hope I'm able to articulate it clearly to you, okay? I want you to think about punishment and forgiveness, seeking forgiveness. And keep those two things in mind as you read this ayah. I'll give you the, the Arabic and then the English in easy language. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah would not be one to punish them so long as you're in their company. The Prophet is being told that he will not destroy Quraysh so long as he is among them. Part one. Part two. Allah would never destroy them, Allah would not be one to punish them so long as they are asking for forgiveness. Now once again I'll reiterate those two parts. Allah will not destroy them until so long as you're among them and Allah will not destroy them so long as they're asking for forgiveness. Those are the two parts, right? Now, the thing that these two parts have in common is Allah would not destroy. Except in the Arabic, the first case of Allah would not destroy is mentioned as a verb. And in the second case, Allah would not destroy is mentioned as a noun. Now what does that mean? That means Allah not destroying in the first case is a temporary clause because verbs by definition are temporary. It's not a constant thing, Allah will never ever ever destroy them. It's not like that. Allah will not destroy them. Allah will not be one to destroy them. So long as you're in their company. Now the Prophet ﷺ being in their company, is that a permanent thing or a temporary thing? It's temporary. So it coincides with, look this clause isn't permanent. It is temporary. So it coincides with the temporary con disclaimer. Now, what about the second case? He says Allah will never ever ever destroy them. That actually is a permanent clause. He didn't say temporarily, um, for now I won't destroy them. No, no, no. He will never ever destroy them. How do we know that? The noun is being used. Okay, so what do they have to do to be permanently saved from Allah's destruction? He says, وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ So long as they are asking for forgiveness. Now here's the kicker. Them asking for forgiveness could have been said as a noun and could have been said as a verb. If you said it as a noun, you would have said, وَهُمْ مُسْتَغْفِرُونَ If you said it as a verb, which Allah did, وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ What does that mean? That means they're not always asking for forgiveness. So long as once in a while, they ask for forgiveness, and they're not constantly begging for forgiveness, I won't destroy them. Had that been a noun, the condition from Allah would have been, unless you are in the constant engagement of begging me for forgiveness, I'm going to destroy you. But He said, at least give me some istighfar. <laughs> There's a mercy of Allah that he used a verb here. Mu'hum yastaghfirun. Look at the flip side. Wa ma kunna muhlikil qura illa wa ahluha zalimun. So awesome. Allah talks about history. This was about what he would never do in the future, right? So we'll wrap it up with history. Allah has destroyed towns. We know that. How does he describe it? We would never, ever, ever destroy the towns. Wa ma kunna muhlikil qura. We would never, ever, ever destroy towns. Muhlikil qura, destroyers of towns. That's a noun. We've never done it ever, ever. Until what? Illa wa ahluha zalimun. Except that its people do wrong. Except that its people do wrong. Now the doing wrong in this ayah is actually a noun. And remember seeking forgiveness was a verb. So it's temporary. So, so long as they do some seeking for forgiveness, they're saved. But doing wrong in this ayah is a noun. Which means until its people were constantly immersed in wrong, I wouldn't destroy them. I didn't just destroy nations when they did wrong. I destroyed nations when they demonstrated a constant pursuit of the wrong. إِلَّا وَأَهْلُهَا ظَالِمُونَ Not يَظْلِمُونَ ظَالِمُونَ Constant pursuit of wrong. So something as small as the difference between nouns and verbs. Wallahi, I've, give, I've given you like three samplers from this. There are literally thousands and thousands of examples of this in the Qur'an. This subject alone leaves me amazed. I hope you guys enjoyed the series. See you next time. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.